Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's been a couple of months since I took a long hard look at what SpaceX are up to with the Starship project. Since the SN5 flight we've seen SN6 do the same thing. And I'll be honest, I had half expected SpaceX to skip this entirely given that it's using an older alloy and seeing how fast serial number 8 was progressing. But it took off from the launch pad accompanied by a burst of flame from the fuel supply disconnect. It started going sideways and controlling itself using basically the gimbal from the engine. The, this time the footage showed that there was no fire on the exterior of the engine itself so they addressed the problem that we saw with SN5. And uh, yeah, then it would descend towards the landing site, it deployed the landing legs and it carefully touched down on to complete the test. So that was a 150 meter hop and you know since then I've also seen some photos of the landing legs and I think I figured out how the shock absorbers on the legs are designed. So they're like box girders with holes that are drilled in them and if you look, the closer to the bottom of the leg, the larger the holes get. So this in turn makes the legs weakest at the bottom. So as it lands hard, it compresses and it compresses harder and harder and harder, but it absorbs the shock as those legs crush. So yeah, they're basically improvised crush cores, that absorb the landing shock and you know, don't transmit it to the rest of the structure. Uh, elsewhere, by the way, SpaceX also released a video showing another successful fairing catch from a Falcon 9. While SpaceX have been reusing fairings for Starlink launches, it looks like most of the fairings are being caught, uh, aren't being caught in the net, but they're instead, you know, soft landing in the water and you're getting fished out. So it's nice to see an actual catch. Back in Boca Chica, the SN 7.1 test tank was uh, tested. It was supposed to demonstrate new alloys and welding techniques used for the later versions. And uh, it reached new levels of pressure, popping at 8 bars or 8 atmospheres of pressure, or 9 at the bottom because of the head with the liquid in the tank. Also, on the test stand right now is serial number 8, and it has wings. But anyway, for me, the most important thing in the last month is the appearance of the first vacuum version of the Raptor engine, or RAP-VAC as I like to call it. We've seen dozens of Raptor engines reach various levels of testing, but these are all the sea level versions. The new Rap Vac is equipped with a much larger nozzle, but otherwise it seems broadly similar to the previous ex uh, example engines we've seen. It even has the two axis bearing at the top to support gimbling, even though the Vac Raps or Rap Vacs are supposed to be fixed in the structure. So generally speaking, What's important here for a vacuum engine is the expansion ratio between the throat of the combustion chamber and the exit at the nozzle. Uh, the higher this ratio, the more performance the engine can extract from the exhaust gases as they expand through it. According to Elon, the expansion ratio for the RAPVAC prototype is 107, compared to the regular Raptor which we think is about 40. However, having large nozzles isn't for everyone. Right, when the exhaust gases expand through the nozzle, the pressure of the gas drops. And if the pressure of the exhaust gases drop too far below atmospheric pressure, then the atmosphere can start to push back inside the nozzle. And this causes a phenomena called flow separation, right? The exhaust gases get pushed away from the nozzle wall and uh, you know that can cause trouble with the engine. There's a, a video here showing the space shuttle main engines throttling up towards full power and before they reach full power you can see this flow separation around the edges of the nozzle and then as it throttles up it gets pushed down. During this if you look carefully you can also see the nozzles are wobbling because this phenomena generates significant like transverse forces which if they are kept up they can damage the engine. So at sea level engines don't have large nozzles so that they don't encounter this phenomena. So anyway, according to Elon, the Rap Vac is very much a prototype engine and it's not optimized for the final performance. I think they've actually optimized this for development time. Firstly, they've chosen a nozzle size which is right at the limit of what they could test in the atmosphere without having big problems with flow separation. If you watch the test video of the actual Raptor, you can see uh, a little bit of flow separation around the edges, but the, the test was clearly su successful. Um, the nozzle looks to be fully regeneratively cooled, and this is distinct from the Merlin vacuum engine, which includes a very large radiatively cooled nozzle extension. 
However, you can't really do this on Starship because on the Merlin, that is essentially exposed to the surface of space. But in Starship, the vacuum versions are up inside the skirt, which means that if they get hot, they would radiate heat into the interior of the skirt. So instead, they have to keep that nozzle cool during firing without baking everything else around it. So they, of course, do regenerative cooling, they pump propellant uh, methane through the walls. So with the older engines, the way that you would manufacture a regeneratively cooled nozzle would be by arranging thousands of individual pipes into the desired shape, and then you would braze weld those together. And this is kind of a laborious process. The Raptor nozzles are made in a different way. What they do is, they, I believe, they start with a sheet of copper and then they machine out channels into it. Then they sandwich this between two sheets of Inconel, and that is your channel wall. Uh, presumably, this same technique is also being used for the larger vacuum nozzle on the Raptor engine, but either way, uh, it, it does look that there's also some uh, extra reinforcing being added to the Raptor vacuum. It's possible that they weren't sure how much flow separation would work and they needed extra strength. It's also possible these stiffeners are just being used for development while it's being used inside the atmosphere. Also, the interest, uh, the interior looks white, and not everyone, sh nobody's really sure what this is, but I think most people think that it's a sort of white ceramic that's designed to reflect heat and possibly protect the chamber wall from oxidation. So when the engine is firing, uh, you can see that it has a very pronounced Mach diamond just beyond the nozzle. This is very similar to the one that we see in the space shuttle. You can also see that as soon as the exhaust gases exit the nozzle, they get compressed down by the atmospheric pressure. And of course, as they get squeezed down, that's where you get that hot spot. It actually surprises some people to know that despite all the energy and violence, the exhaust gases that are leaving that nozzle at supersonic speeds, they're also leaving that at lower pressure than the atmosphere around us. There's also some telltale bright uh, beads along the interior of the nozzle, and you know that's where the flow separation is happening. So anyway, clearly they can't put a larger nozzle on this test one because it would then uh, have problems at sea level. They would have to have a special testing facility. Uh, there are testing facilities that let you test vacuum engines, but uh, they're big and expensive. So the video also lets us hear the Starship, uh, sorry, the Raptor startup sequence, and it is really fast. You can hear those turbo pumps spin up in a fraction of a second. There's a small burst of flame, a uh, burst of cold cryogenic gases, and then finally the full ignition in all its glory. Compare this to the Space Shuttle's engine startup sequence. That takes several seconds to ramp up. The shuttle engines, they start using only pressure from the tanks and, you know, they take a little longer to get up to speed. But the Raptor is a more complicated engine. It has this full flow uh, cycle where it has two turbo pumps which are both dependent on each other pumping fuel. And if one pump runs faster than the other, it messes up with the fuel oxidizer ratio for both turbines. So it's safer to get the turbines up to speed very quickly using a separate high pressure gas supply. So that rapid startup is used by all the Raptor engines. It's not just a vacuum version. Uh, and actually, of course, it's a very good thing. If you are falling from the sky and depend on starting up your rocket engines quickly to land, then you want the rocket engines to start up very quickly. Anyway, this engine is very likely going to be improved. Elon has stated publicly that he wants to aim for a performance of 380 seconds of specific impulse. But based on 300 bar chamber pressure and the known expansion ratio, this puts the performance in the ballpark of about 370 seconds. If they want to raise it that extra and get up to 380, they'd need a larger nozzle. And there might be some room in the rear end of the Starship, but I don't think there's really enough to get to where they need to be. But instead of expanding the nozzle, they could actually shrink the throat down instead, and that would let them reach the, the expansion ratio between the throat and the nozzle. Rough math suggests that uh, if they got the expansion ratio to about 200 to 1 while maintaining the 300 bar chamber pressure, that would satisfy the 380 target. Doing this would require a lot more changes to the engine. The, the power head would probably have to be redesigned a bit. The smaller throat means that for the same pressure, you've got lower propellant flow rates, which would probably mean changes to both of the pumps to optimize them for the different flow rates. 
And of course, such a design would then have an exit pressure so low that it couldn't be tested with the full nozzle at sea level. So again, more testing resources needed there. But that's for the future. Right now, it's great to see this working and I am eager to see how this evolves over time. And yes, in the next few days, we are expecting to see some testing on the very first winged Starship build. SN8 is on the launch site with the rear flaps attached. What we'll probably see is the usual setup of a pressure test, cryogenic test, static fire. But unlike the previous tests, I expect if they're all successful, then we might see them take it back and fit a nose cone rather than going with a mass simulator seen in the previous test. Or we might see a mass simulator first. It doesn't. They could fit the mass simulator on the test site. They might not be able to do that with the nose cone without returning it to the high bays. Um, either way, it's they're probably aiming for another 150 meter hop with a, a mass sim or a nose cone. But then, yes, the ultimate plan for this is a flight to 15 kilometers, followed by shutting down the engines and letting it fall under aerodynamic control in the belly flop maneuver. And finally, as it gets low, it'll... Uh, adjust its aerodynamics, fire up its engines, and hopefully perform a safe landing. But honestly, this test is one I'm really worried about for now because they've demonstrated everything else. They've never even demonstrated this with a subscale model. This is something that's entirely in computer simulation. So this is a bold move to be trying to do a full scale flight of this. But hey, you know, they are getting ahead of themselves now in terms of building prototypes faster than they're blowing them up. So they can probably afford to do a full-size test, assuming the test doesn't result in the thing going out of the way, going out of control and you know smashing into their test site. That would probably set them back. Either way, yeah, we're getting towards being able to see a proper test flight of SN8 towards the end of the year. I also wouldn't be surprised if when Elon does his Starship update presentation that they have a full uh, SN8 with a nose cone and flaps and wings all installed, but uh, we'll see what happens there. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.